29-year-old Texas woman has been sentenced to death for a terrible crime. Titles like that have been repeated over time, but what is it about this particular case? Taylor Renee Parker is 29 years old and she is a mother of two. She had her first baby, a daughter, at 17 years old when she also dropped out of high school. Her youngest child, a boy, was born when she was around 24 years old. The kids had different fathers. The relationship with her son's father ended up not working out and they got divorced. Taylor married the man named Hunter 11 days after her separation with Tommy was final. This would also not work out, so they got a divorce in April 2019. Taylor met Wade Griffin at a rodeo a few weeks after her second divorce. From the very beginning, Wade was pressured into getting very serious with Taylor. He received text messages from her father, her grandmother, and other family members that were often suggesting the two should get married. Taylor told Wade that she was in the early stages of a pregnancy and she lost the baby because she was hit in the belly by a cord. This made him want to be protective of her and just be there to support her. Over time, Taylor's stories became more and more complex. Taylor informed Wade that she would get millions of dollars in oil and gas royalties as an inheritance. She claimed that she was terrified and that her mother Shauna had hired a hitman to kill her. Wade then invited her to move in with him so he could give her a sense of security. Taylor revealed to him that her mother was hacking into their phones and that the Mexican mafia was now involved and that the situation quickly deteriorated and resulted in a shootout with the FBI. Taylor claimed that this did not have media coverage just because it was kept a secret. Wade was working long hours for different businesses, one of which was related to cattle administration and another one concerning purchasing and selling of hogs. The money he made, however, was now used to satisfy Taylor's requests. It's unclear how many times he bought things with money he already earned and how many times he actually took loans. Either way, Taylor claimed that she would pay him back and cover the debts with the inheritance she was about to gain access to. The couple had their eyes set on an expensive hunting property, listed at the price of $4.7 million. When I say couple, I'm talking mostly about Taylor, because Wade was somehow persuaded into thinking he wanted that property as well. Not wasting time, Taylor contacted the sales agent and let him know she was the heir of a multi-million dollar business called the Blackburn Syrup, and she placed an offer for $3.5 million for the property. For this, she also had to make a deposit of around $200,000. Wade's family liked Taylor at first. She seemed like a nice young woman who was clearly in love with him. She always made sure to have a warm plate of food for whenever Wade came back from work, and he really enjoyed that. There was, however, a red flag that the family couldn't just ignore, and that was the fact that she did not have custody of her two kids. They had that question of why would that be, since usually the court sides with the mother and the mother gets the kids in case of a divorce. Those suspicions were quickly overlooked come Christmas time, when Taylor and Wade announced they were in the process of buying the hunting property. The family liked to hunt ducks and Taylor promised them they would soon be able to do that without any obstacle. That purchase, however, was doomed to fail. Taylor was initially expected to receive a $7 million wire transfer from the Blackburn estate. She intended to use that money to confirm she had the funds necessary to purchase the property, but the wire never arrived. She then claimed to use oil and gas revenue, but that wire also never arrived. Things escalated pretty quickly, and now she wanted to also buy two more properties and the price for all three combined was of around $20 million. She could not give proof that she did afford to make that purchase, however. The sales agent started to become suspicious and a little frustrated as the deal was delayed for quite some time, and if he managed to make that sale, he would have received a substantial commission. Taylor said it didn't matter that there were issues with both inheritance, because she also had a rich uncle named Butch that would give her the necessary funds to buy the lands. She did provide the required paperwork from her oil and gas lease, 
but the agent and his team quickly figured out those had a high chance of being fake, since the email address on the papers was from an AOL account with the name of Shelly Links. The agent emailed Shelly Links and also tried to get in contact with said Uncle Butch without much success. Taylor threw a tantrum and sent the agent an email stating she talked to a lawyer and that only the seller can ask for proof of funds, but not the agent. Shelly Links also eventually responded to the email and said, Banking information is completely confidential. The buyers were not under the assumption a verification letter was required until you requested it in your office. I'm sending this verification form since I will be providing the funds. The email goes on to say that it doesn't matter where the money comes from as long as the seller gets paid. The sales agent's worst fears came true. Taylor got in touch with him in April 2020 and informed him that the deal was over. There was no Uncle Butch, no syrup royalty and no oil and gas lease. She claimed that her mother made up all of these characters, including Shelley Lynx. Needless to say, that made everyone raise some eyebrows since it was all pretty weird. This, however, was not the only reason why Wade's family had rising suspicions with regards to Taylor. In December 2019, two other major things happened. First, Taylor announced that she was expecting a baby and, of course, Wade was the father. Second, she gifted Wade's mother, Connie, a Nissan. She was once again perceived as a very nice person for surprising Connie with such a generous present. The happiness didn't last long though, as just a few weeks after, Taylor said Connie needed to bring back the car to Taylor and Wade's house because the dealership had recalled it and they had to pick it up. That made Connie again suspect something was off with Taylor. She decided to call the dealership to see what was going on and what do you know, the car was not recalled, it was just never paid for. Taylor quickly found a way to move the attention to something else, and in March, she decided to go public with her pregnancy on Facebook, stating that the baby was now a priority and money misunderstandings can wait. At some point in 2019, Taylor met Angela Pate, whose husband worked with Wade. They spent time together and Taylor shared with Angela the fears she had about Wade leaving her, now, back to March 2020, when Taylor posted about her pregnancy on social media, Angela started to think something was just not adding up. She remembered that Taylor once confided in her and said she had a hysterectomy years prior, so there was no chance she could have been expecting a baby. Taylor assured Angela she was really pregnant and they even went so far as to go to a clinic together to get proof of pregnancy. Considering it was 2020 and there were a lot of restrictions regarding how many people were allowed in the hospitals, Angela waited outside while Taylor entered the clinic by herself. When she came out, she did have a paper that confirmed she was in fact expecting a baby. Angela had no reasons to doubt Taylor anymore because 1. the paper looked authentic and 2. when Taylor went inside the clinic, she only had her wallet with her and the document had never been folded, so Taylor could not have falsified that, right? The reason the two women even went to the clinic was that initially, Taylor showed Angela a document stating her pregnancy that had the name of the nurse signing the paper and the name of the patient as the same person, so Taylor's name was actually nowhere to be found. But Taylor had an explanation for that, of course, Turns out her mother hired a mole inside the clinic that made it look like she was not in fact pregnant and casted doubts on her telling the truth. Should I mention the fact that Taylor once told Angela that her mother took her own life, but then at a Christmas party she was seen alive and well? Yeah, Taylor had many such incidents in which what she said did not really match with the reality. Right after Taylor told Angela there was a person trying to sabotage her and make it look like she was lying and this person was on her mother's payroll, Angela was actually contacted by someone claiming to be Taylor's mother via email. The name of this person was allegedly Mandy Body, and this is what the email said. Listen, you don't know nothing about Taylor. Don't try to be a mother figure to her. I did an amazing job making her look bad. It took time and accurately planning my every step of the way. She brought you to the bank and made herself look like she was lying to get a check cashed. 
I had already arranged everything. My helper knew she was coming with you. You wasted your time on her because that check was never good. Let her fail in life. Let her see what it's like to have nothing. I've worked it out perfectly. I arranged this all so there are no cracks, you see. Things won't add up and she will look even more like a liar. I stole numbers to make her think people were calling and doing things for her and it was never them. This will not end well for her. No matter where she turns or what she says, there will always be a lie to fall back on her. See, I'm going to send her in such a deep depression, she will probably try to take her life like she has tried before. But if not, then making Wade leave her will do the trick. See, he will have no choice but to leave because nothing will be true. I've made his family turn on them for pretending to be people like a dealership that didn't get paid. Does it click now to you people? Just let her fall into a hole and not get out. She will go crazy thinking she did the right thing for a certain reason. But in reality, I made her think that way. She has a way of wanting to protect everyone. Well, that's what got her into this mess. If you want to be her mom, good luck. She's like the child we should have terminated in the beginning because she was the accident I didn't want. Maybe you will get the big picture and enjoy the mess. She's looking for someone to love her, and when Wade leaves because I've made her out to be a liar, well, she'll come running to you. Just watch. Nice website and Facebook. Maybe you can pop some sense into her because she has none. I mean, does sound legit, right? Taylor and Wade hosted a gender reveal party. Yes, yes, she took pictures with Belly, she got gifts and all the congratulations, she even invited someone from the clinic to the party, but that person did not attend. Hint, that person really knew what was going on, and Taylor still had the audacity to send out an invitation. Taylor and Wade told everyone that they were having a baby girl and they would name her Clancy Gale. Wade's mother Connie was absolutely convinced that Taylor was faking it all. The pregnancy, the evil mother that she claimed she had, but she didn't have a way to make Wade understand this as well. The alleged war between Taylor and her mother continued. According to her, there were cameras installed in their backyard meant to spy on the couple. Then emails were sent to Wade with threats and he actually believed all of it. Meanwhile, Taylor continued to show everyone sonograms, she bought baby clothing and she even created a baby registry. If initially she says she was due September 22nd, in the registry the date was September 28th. The thing is, not only Wade's mom thought Taylor was full of it, but also some of Wade's friends and they tried to warn him, but he wouldn't listen. He was actually pretty upset about the whole situation and couldn't understand how everyone thought he couldn't tell if Taylor was in fact pregnant or not. Nevertheless, he did try to find out things on his own, but he was never allowed inside the clinic with Taylor for checkups due to the restrictions. When he called the hospital, they wouldn't tell him anything because the info about the patients was private. Let's not forget that Taylor and Wade were never married, so he had no legal rights to ask about her health status. People thought that come September, Taylor will come up with a story explaining how she lost the pregnancy due to some horrible event or maybe because of her mother. Mid-September, still no baby. Taylor's ex-husband Tommy contacted Wade and told him she had a hysterectomy and the sonograms she was showing everyone were actually from her previous pregnancies. But when she was asked about why the date is not correct on them, she just said the clinic had system errors. Again, Taylor was the victim in this situation and Tommy was just trying to make her look bad. Among all the amazing qualities Taylor had, such as creativity, storytelling, you know, she was also a photographer. Back in 2019, she was actually hired by a couple, Homer and Reagan Hancock, to take pictures at their wedding. Taylor and Reagan remained in contact via Facebook. At this point, Taylor was having a hard time explaining and justifying all of the misunderstandings surrounding her pregnancy, and she was tired of fighting her mother and now she also had to deal with a vendetta that her ex-husband suddenly had on her, so she got closer to Reagan as she needed someone to talk to. Reagan and Homer were expecting their first child together, a baby girl they already knew they would name Rexlin Sage. 
Reagan had a three-year-old daughter from a previous relationship, but the couple raised little Kenley as their own, and they were pretty excited about expanding their family. On September 22nd, Taylor contacted a man regarding the possibility of purchasing a trailer full of hogs for just a little over $6,000. The buyer felt that that was a fraud because she didn't appear to be knowledgeable about license and transportation regulations, so he was uninterested. She contacted him again on September 27 and informed him that she had organized everything, but he continued to say no. Three days later, on September 30th, Taylor had a doctor appointment and when she got there, she was crying uncontrollably, saying her husband was in the military and he had just been killed and on top of that, her own mother cancelled on her, so she didn't want to have the exam alone. She rescheduled the appointment for the following day. There was still no baby on October 5th. Wade's home caught fire at that point. Because this fire was started on purpose and with the use of a lighter, it was deemed to be an act of arson. Taylor was supposedly scheduled for having her delivery being induced on that exact day, but the hospital had a bomb threat and they had to postpone everything. This really did happen, it was not a lie, but since Wade's mother Connie did not believe any word coming out of Taylor's mouth, she actually said to her, yeah, you called it in. Later in the investigation, this would be confirmed. Taylor downloaded a voice-changing app. She pretended to be a man and she called the hospital to say there was a bomb. On October 8th, Taylor bought a baby gift and a coffee and spent the day at Reagan's house. They had such a good time that Reagan later posted on Facebook about how happy she was she got to see Taylor and she was looking forward to having many more days like these. Taylor had another appointment for the delivery induction on October 9th. In the morning, she told Wade to go sell the hogs to the buyer she spoke to on September 22nd. He had refused the offer, but Wade didn't know that. He in fact had text messages from the said buyer saying he was waiting for Wade to arrive at about 6.30 am. Wade drove for about 4 hours to get to the buyer's house in order to sell the hogs. At 6.46 am, Taylor filled up her car with gas and made the McDonald's pit stop. Then, shortly after 9.30 a.m., Taylor was stopped after an officer witnessed her driving erratically and at a high speed. When Taylor noticed the state trooper was following her, she contacted 911 and requested an ambulance, and she said she had given birth into the car. She responded that she was en route to Idabel where her doctor was when asked where she was. Taylor was stopped in Texas, not in Oklahoma, where Idabel is situated. A newborn infant in distress and an umbilical cord protruding from Taylor's clothes were both visible to the officer as he approached Taylor's car. She also had the placenta in her pants. There were several red flags that the officer noticed. First, even if there was a lot of blood on Taylor, it was already dry. Second, there was no blood on the car seat. Third, when the ambulance arrived, Taylor said that the baby was due on September 30th, but everyone was concerned and confused since the baby they were trying to save was not at all overdue, in fact it was very very small and it looked premature. Taylor said she was shopping in a Walmart in the city of New Boston when she felt the urge to push, so she got into her car and tried to get to the hospital. While Taylor was going through this, Wade was going through a very confusing and frustrating situation with the supposed hog buyer. Although Wade had text with confirmation and information about the payment, the buyer did not anticipate seeing Wade there in the early morning hours. Wade learned that the buyer had a conversation with Taylor back in September, and he also found out that the number he was receiving messages with the address and all of that, it was not actually the buyer's phone number. In the end, Wade sold the hogs for $2,500 instead of the initial $6,000 he thought he had agreed on. Then he was on his way home. Let's fill in the missing time from when Taylor was seen at the McDonald's until she was stopped by the police officer. Reagan Hancock received a text message at 7.22 a.m. from a Google app number. She received another text at 7.49 and at 7.52 she answered. By 8.30 a.m., Reagan's husband Homer began to receive a string of odd text messages from Reagan. 
In those texts, she expressed her desire for happiness and acknowledged that their relationship was not bringing her that. The texts didn't appear to be written in Reagan's manner, and they didn't sound at all like her, which perplexed him. At 8.33, he sent her a I love you text message, but he didn't hear back. Homer received a Facebook message from a neighbor at 9.34 a.m., informing him that their puppy was seen out of the house alone. At 9.36, Homer made an attempt to get in touch with Reagan to let her know she had to get the dog. Another thing that the neighbor mentioned was that the garage door was open, which was odd as well. His call was unanswered by Reagan. He kept trying to phone her at 9.58, at 10.02, at 10.04, 10.06, and 10.20, but no one responded. He called his loved ones and friends and left work to go check on Reagan. Reagan's mother, Jessica Brooks, arrived at the house around 10.15 to see how her daughter was doing. Reagan was lying face down in a pool of blood when she entered. Marcus, her husband, followed shortly after and entered the house. She reported her daughter's murder when she dialed 911. She stated that there was blood all over as the 911 operator inquired as to what had occurred. Kinley, Reagan's three-year-old daughter, can be heard asking, where's mommy, three minutes into the 911 call, and she was found in her room, hiding under a blanket. When the police arrived, they found that Reagan's baby was missing from her womb. Reagan had numerous deep incisions and stab wounds all over her body. Her uterus was removed entirely from her body after being sliced from hip to hip. She had numerous defensive wounds on her hands, cuts all over her fingers and palms, and bruises as well. Her finger was dislocated, and one of her fingertips was nearly severed. The house was also in a terrible condition. The officers found bloody prints, clumps of hair, broken items, and more. Homer spotted Kinley on the driveway when he arrived home, and he was not allowed in the house. Taylor was in the hospital, and she was undergoing an examination she fought really hard to avoid. She had no internal bleeding, and the physicians found she lacked the cervix. In addition to performing a physical examination, they also collected blood samples for analysis. She lacked the hormones of pregnancy. Taylor still claimed that while driving, she gave birth to the child inside the vehicle. After learning what occurred to Reagan Hancock, the neighborhood police started searching for the kid child. At 1.22 p.m., the tiny baby girl was tragically pronounced dead at the hospital. The police knew what had happened at that point. At the hospital, Taylor was detained and charged with capital murder of Reagan and the kidnapping and murder of her unborn baby girl. When questioned, Taylor reported an altercation between her and Reagan, and she claimed that when she shoved Reagan to the ground, Reagan was so seriously hurt that she feared for the life of her child and asked Taylor to take the child. After the infant was removed, she was not breathing, she claimed, according to the detectives. Taylor was then told by Reagan to head straight to the hospital. Taylor's testimony indicated that Reagan was alive when she left the house. Taylor tried to push the narrative that she had been having issues with sleeping and migraines, and when she got to Reagan's house, she was in fact in and out of sleeping. I guess she wanted to make it look like she was not responsible for anything because she was sleepwalking, sleep driving, and sleep murdering. The trial of Taylor Parker started in September 2022 and it ended in October. During the trial, many more details about Taylor's previous relationships came to light. In the brief time she was with Hunter, she faked seizures. She lied about finances to him as well, she lied to her friends also, telling them that during her marriage with Hunter, they had hired a surrogate, and Hunter left her for the surrogate. Court records indicate that mid-September 2020, Taylor was researching C-sections online. The day of the murder, early in the morning, after Wade left to sell the hogs, Taylor watched YouTube videos about C-sections in births at 35 weeks. That was just before she left the house to go get gas, McDonald's, and the baby that was not yet born. The jury took just 90 minutes to deliberate, come up with a guilty verdict, and the death penalty. There are many details about this case that I didn't share here, and some things really are better left unsaid. 
Lisa Marie Montgomery was born on February 27, 1968, in Melbourne, Kansas. Because of Montgomery's mother's alcoholism, Lisa was born with irreversible brain damage. She was allegedly essayed and beaten from the age of 11 by her stepfather and his buddies while growing up in a home that was physically and mentally violent. She turned to alcohol as a means of mental escapism. Montgomery's mother learned of the abuse when she was 14 and reacted by threatening her daughter with a revolver. Montgomery attempted to flee by getting married at the age of 18, but both her first marriage and the second one ended in abuse. Prior to having her tubes tied in 1990, Montgomery had four children. Both her first and second husbands testified that she repeatedly claimed to be pregnant after the operation. In 2004, Lisa Montgomery befriended Bobby Joe Stinnett. They bonded over dog shows on a website about rat terriers. At the time, Bobby Jo Stinnett was 23 years old and pregnant and she was excited to learn that Lisa was also expecting a baby. Lisa was in fact not pregnant. Bobby Jo Stinnett, who was born on December 4, 1981, graduated from Graham, Missouri's Nodaway Holt High School in 2000. Stinnett and her husband had a dog breeding operation out of their Skidmore home. While they were exchanging emails about their pregnancies, Montgomery was planning something awful. On December 16, 2004, Montgomery traveled to Stinnett's house saying she was Darlene Fisher and wanted to buy a terrier. Stinnett welcomed her inside the house, but she had no idea what dark thoughts the smiling possible customer actually had. Montgomery strangled Bobby Jo Stinnett, then she cut her unborn child from her womb and fled the scene with the baby. Around an hour later, Stinnett was found by her mother, Becky Harper, lying in a pool of blood. Harper immediately dialed 911 and described the injuries sustained by her daughter as looking like her gut had exploded. Stinnett was declared dead at Maryville St. Francis Hospital after paramedics failed to resuscitate her. Montgomery allegedly called her husband Kevin that day at around 5.15 p.m. to report going into labor and giving birth while shopping in Topeka. On December 17th, the day after, authorities detained Montgomery at her farmstead in Mulvern, Kansas. A witness remembered that Montgomery went out to breakfast the morning before she was arrested with her husband, two teenage kids, and the infant. After following online interactions to Montgomery's IP address, police went to her house originally with the intention of speaking with her as a witness. They located the car that matched the description of the one at the crime site when they got there, and when they went inside, they discovered Montgomery holding the baby and watching TV. After Montgomery's narrative fell apart and she admitted to the crime, she was taken into custody. The kidnapped infant was found and given to the father. The utilization of forensic computer investigations, which followed Montgomery and Stinnett's online correspondence, was credited with the swift recovery and capture. The publication of an Amber Alert to solicit assistance from the public helped the inquiry. Since there was no victim description and the alert had never been utilized in a case involving an unborn child, it was first rejected. The alert was eventually put into effect thanks to Congressman Sam Graves' intervention. The identity of the infant was verified through DNA testing. Montgomery's motivation was thought to have been related to a miscarriage she may have experienced and kept secret from her family at the time of her arrest. After rumors that her ex-husband intended to reveal she had lied about being pregnant in order to win custody of her kids, more questions about her motivations emerged. It was hypothesized that Montgomery needed to have a baby in order to refute the accusation that she had a pattern of lying about being pregnant. A neuropsychologist testified during a hearing before the trial that head traumas Montgomery had suffered in the past may have harmed the area of the brain that regulates aggression. Her defense attorneys, led by Frederick Duchard, claimed she had a mental illness that causes a woman to mistakenly believe she is pregnant and display external indicators of pregnancy during her federal court trial. The Guardian reports that Touchard made an attempt to make this defense only one week before the trial started, after being forced to drop the conflicting claim that Stinnett was killed by Tommy Montgomery, who actually had an alibi. As a result, Montgomery's family refused to work with Duchard and gave the jury information about her past. 
Montgomery suffered pseudociasis in addition to depression, borderline personality disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, according to expert testimony from Dr. V. S. Ramachandran and M.D. William Logan. Ramachandran testified that Montgomery was unable to control the kind and caliber of her activities and that her delusional state caused her accounts about the crime to shift. The opposing expert witness forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz and federal prosecutor Roseanne Ketchmark disagreed with the diagnosis of pseudociasis. On October 22, 2007, despite the defense's assertion that Montgomery was insane, the jury came to the conclusion that she was guilty. On October 26, the jury made the death penalty recommendation and Montgomery was officially given the death penalty by Judge Gary A. Fenner on April 4, 2008. Good evening, everyone. Montgomery will die for killing a pregnant woman and kidnapping her baby. Well, Jim, it took the jury less than five hours to reach their verdict. Montgomery's eyes were downcast, and she cried quietly as the judge read the decision. Death for Lisa Montgomery and a lifetime of pain for her victim's family. We will never stop missing Bobby Jo. She was a sweet and loving wife, daughter, and sister, and would have been a wonderful mother. Becky Harper is the mom of 23-year-old Bobby Jo Stinnett, the grandmother of Victoria Jo. The jury sent a clear message in their verdict form that while they believe Montgomery was physically, mentally, and sexually abused as a child, she is still totally responsible for the crimes she committed. Victoria Jo will turn three on the third anniversary of her mother's murder. Her father and the rest of the family thanked everyone involved that they still have her. Victoria Jo is very beautiful, looks a lot like her mother, um, talking, very intelligently talking. Lisa Montgomery's husband has remained by her side. His face today was that of a devastated man pulled in so many directions for so very long. I'm leaving the courthouse after hearing a jury recommend that his wife die for her crime, Montgomery's eyes were red with emotion and promising to stand by her and their marriage. The prosecutor gave you a circus. It's pretty bad pretty bad when you think there's a winner in this. Montgomery describes his wife as not just his wife, but his very good friend. Lisa Montgomery's attorney says she's a sweet individual, and he wishes he could have made that more clear to the jury. The full extent of Montgomery's earlier trauma, independent diagnosis of mental illness, and Duchard's pseudociasis defense were not made public until after her conviction. As a result, detractors, including Guardian journalist David Rose, said that Duchard failed to adequately defend Montgomery in court. In November 2016, Fenner demanded that Duchard undergo cross-examination. Duchard brushed off all criticism and stood by his actions. Montgomery's request for a review was rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court on March 19, 2012. She was detained at the Federal Medical Center, Carswell, in Fort Worth, Texas, where she remained behind bars until she was moved to the location of her execution. Montgomery was assigned the Federal Bureau of Prisons Identification Number 11072-031. She was the sole female federal death row inmate at Federal Medical Center Carswell for a long period of time. The baby, Victoria Jo Stinnett, was not regarded a person until she was taken from her mother's womb, according to Montgomery's attorneys, who made this argument during her appeals. Bobby had already passed away, hence the offense was actually death resulting in kidnapping. The courts rejected the argument, stating that the felony murder rule rendered it irrelevant and that Montgomery would still have had to murder Bobby in order to finish the kidnapping. Following her conviction, Montgomery was investigated by experts who came to the conclusion that she had long-standing psychosis, bipolar disorder, and PTSD at the time of her crime. She was allegedly often beaten by her parents and spouses, which caused irreversible brain damage in addition to her frequent disassociation from reality. The United States Constitution's Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual punishments, including the execution of those who have intellectual disabilities. The death sentence may have been overturned or the matter may have been investigated further if there was extremely compelling and uncontested evidence. At the U.S. Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana, Montgomery was due to be executed by lethal injection on December 8, 2020, but her execution was postponed after her attorneys got sick. Montgomery received a new execution date of January 12, 2021 on December 23, 2020. 
U.S. District Court Judge Randolph Moss ruled that the director's order setting a new execution date while the court's stay was in force was not in compliance with law, preventing the execution from being rescheduled before January 1, 2022. A three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit overturned Moss's decision on January 1st, thereby restoring her January 12th execution date. In accordance with the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, it may be argued she did not grasp the reasons for her death on that day. Thus, federal judge Patrick Hanlon granted a stay of execution on the basis that her mental capacity must first be assessed. The Supreme Court then overturned the stay with a 6-3 to decision. The immediate execution of the death sentence was ordered. On January 12th, she landed at Ter Hot's execution row. The United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana carried out Montgomery's execution by lethal injection on January 13, 2021. She declined to offer any final words when asked whether she had any. At 1.31 in the morning, she was declared dead. Lisa Montgomery has been executed at the federal prison complex in Terre Haute overnight. She was granted a last-minute stay to evaluate her mental health, but that was overturned. The Associated Press reporting the 52-year-old was pronounced dead at 1.31 a.m. after receiving a lethal injection. Lisa Montgomery's older sister, Diane Mattingly, claimed that she too had experienced a stay in the home prior to entering foster care. She advocated strongly for the life of her sister. I went into a place where I was loved and cared for and shown self-worth, Mattingly said. I had a good foundation. Lisa did not, and she broke. She literally broke. Yes, I do believe that she does need to spend the rest of her life in prison. What had happened to Bobby Joe was horrendous. But I'm here because I want people to understand the torture that my sister endured her whole life. And that the people that had let her down over and over and over again, from her mother who's supposed to love her and protect her, to a father who was supposed to be there and protect her, and he abandoned her, to the police officer that she told that she was being raped, and he drove her to her house and dropped her off and drove away. Montgomery was the first woman executed in the U.S. since Kelly Gizendainer in 2015, the first person executed in the country in 2021, and the first female federal prisoner in 67 years. Only three other women have been put to death by the American federal government, Mary Surratt in 1865 by hanging, Ethel Rosenberg in 1953 by electric chair, and Bonnie Hedy in 1953 by gas chamber. Victoria Jo Stinnett is now 19 years old. Her father, Zeb Stinnett, as well as the extended family, made sure she was taken care of and raised in a loving environment. While I absolutely feel sorry for little Lisa Montgomery, who suffered horrific abuse from the people that should have protected her, I don't feel the same way about the woman she became. I do believe there was psychological damage, depression, and other mental issues. However, she did know right from wrong. She was a functional adult who had two marriages and kids of her own that she raised and tried at least to give them an education. This tells me she had the capacity of understanding life and society rules in general. She planned to murder Bobby Joe Stinnett, and she made sure she created the right circumstances to accomplish that. This was not a crime executed in a moment of insanity or rage, this was premeditated. Bobby Joe was just 23 years old, and she had a lifetime ahead of her to spend with her husband and daughter. Lisa Montgomery suffered a lot during her lifetime, and she could have chosen to be empathic, loving. She could have decided to be everything her family wasn't. She chose to inflict pain and suffering on others with the same disregard for them that was shown to her. We talked last week about Wanda Jean Allen. She had a low IQ and actual brain injuries that really could have played a part in the way she turned out as a person. That's why I felt like a life sentence would have been enough in her case. For Lisa, however, I feel like the death penalty was fair. Depression or a hard life growing up does not grant a license to murder other people. Let's remember, this was not a crime of passion. In Lisa's mind, this was to reinforce that she was in fact not a liar and to keep her marriage. She was a liar. She was a murderer. The death penalty was not too much for her robbing a mother from her child, a wife from her husband, or a daughter from her parents.
On the 19th of August, 2017, an eight-month pregnant young woman disappeared without a trace from her apartment building. She had ordered a pizza that was left untouched on the kitchen table, and she was looking forward to meeting her baby daughter in the weeks that followed. This is the story of Savannah Greywind. She was born on August 9th of 1995 in Belcourt, North Dakota. Her father is a Spirit Lake member, and her mother is a member of the Turtle Mountain tribe. The family moved to Fargo in Savannah's early years, but they eventually decided to return to the Spirit Lake Tribe Reservation when she turned nine years old. She graduated from Warwick Public School on the reservation and attended Lake Region State College and earned a certificate of nursing assistant. Her boyfriend Ashton was also a Spirit Lake Tribe member. They met in middle school and they had been together for over seven years. Savannah moved to Fargo in 2016 to take a job as a certified nursing assistant at the Aventide Fargo Senior Living Communities. The relationship between Savannah and Ashton was going very well, and soon they found out they were expecting their first baby due in September of 2017. At the time of the news, they were not living together, as Ashton was working in Minneapolis, but he immediately moved to Fargo to be close to his girlfriend and soon-to-be daughter. Her family also wanted to support her in any way possible, so her mother, her father, and younger brother all decided to move to Fargo as well to be there, live with her, and help when needed. Savannah at this point was very happy with her life. She had a great job, she felt loved by the people around her, and she was excited to meet her baby girl. She was also enrolled in North Dakota State University. She had several other passions, and one of those was riding horses. She was very friendly as a person and enjoyed social interactions, both in real life and on social media. On September 1st, she had plans to move in with her boyfriend in their own apartment. On the day of August 19, 2017, Savannah was preparing for what she thought would be the most exciting chapter in her life. At eight months pregnant, she was spending most of her time organizing the move to the new apartment. At 1.30 p.m., Savannah texted her mother that she was about to go to a neighbor's apartment to help her with a dress that the neighbor wanted to hem on her, and she was also going to get paid $20 for this favor. One hour later, she was still not home and her mother sent her brother to go check on her, because he was supposed to get a ride from his sister and was waiting for her to come back from the neighbor. He knocked on the door of said neighbor, but nobody answered, even though he heard what he believed to be a sewing machine running in the apartment, so he went back home without her. At this point, her father went to the neighbor and knocked on the door, and this time a woman answered and said Savannah is going to be just a little bit longer. Savannah's mom eventually drove her son to work because he could not keep waiting any longer for his sister to help him with this. By 4.30 p.m., she realized that her daughter still wasn't home, so she went back to the neighbor and the woman said Savannah already left. This seemed very strange for the mom, as Savannah ordered the pizza before leaving the house that she never ate, so she was planning to come back home as soon as she was done helping the neighbor. Ashton said that he was also in contact with Savannah before he left home, and then all of a sudden, she stopped replying to texts. Savannah's car was still at home, so her mom knew there was very little possibility for her to have just walked anywhere because she was eight months pregnant, and it was not easy to go on foot to the store or any other place. Because she was always on Facebook or on her phone, the family was concerned as now she was not active on any social media platform and she had no reason to just run away or disappear. In fact, she's never done anything like this before. Also, the day before, Savannah was out with her sister buying baby stuff and she was having a good time. She was very cheery and positive. The whole thing seemed very strange for the entire family, so they decided to call the police. Law enforcement started looking for her, completely surrounding their apartment and neighborhood. Of course, they also went to check the apartment where she was less known to be, and this time the door was answered by both a man and a woman, which allowed the officers to enter and check the rooms, but nothing was found. Savannah's family felt like things were not moving fast enough or in the right direction, so they wanted to bring the case to the attention of as many people as possible by putting posters or pictures of her everywhere, including on social media. The police checked the surroundings and the apartment buildings, including the one in which she was before disappearing, but in spite of all the discussions they had with Savannah's friends, family members, even her employer, there was no lead whatsoever. 
By Wednesday, August 23rd, there was no progress on the case, and the family decided to hold a prayer event at the Sanford Medical Center in downtown Fargo, and they asked for the police to contact the FBI for support in this matter. There was also a reward of $7,000 on the table. Not even the dogs involved in the searches were able to find any trace of Savannah. On August 24th at 10 a.m., the police did one more search on the couple's apartment, and this time, they were surprised to find a newborn baby, and they suspected this was actually Savannah's baby. The couple, named William Hone, 32 years old, and Broke Cruz, 38 years old, took good care of the baby, and the little girl was taken to the hospital, then reunited with Savannah's family. The two were arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to commit kidnapping, and the apartment building was closed off so that the forensic investigators could search for evidence. Before Brock started a relationship with William, she was with another man named Aaron, and they had a daughter together. Brock was never involved in raising this daughter, and never paid child support, nor was interested in being a part of her life. In fact, she had three other children that she simply wanted nothing to do with and was never involved in their lives. William, on the other hand, also had two children of his own, one of which he was abusive towards when he was only a baby back in 2011, when one of his kids was rushed to the hospital with a fractured skull and the medical team concluded the injury was caused by the father, so he was charged with child abuse. In her childhood, Broke did not have a stable home with a place of her own, as she was constantly moving from a foster care family to another, and she never felt love or that she was wanted anywhere. She was also quite angry and had a bad temper. One time, she threatened William with a hammer because she got upset over some bills. The relationship between the two started in 2014, and it was very toxic, filled with arguments and even physical assault. In 2016, William threw Broke into a bathtub and he pleaded guilty in court. Then they had a year of no contact to respect, but obviously they didn't. Only six months after that, the police was called to a location because neighbors said there was disturbance and the couple was found together. He pleaded guilty for violating the no contact order as well. On Sunday, August 27, at 5.45 in the evening, a body wrapped up in plastic and taped to a log in the river was discovered in the Red River by two kayakers. At 8.20, the body was pulled out of the river and one hour later, it was identified as Savannah Greywind. Brock denied to have had anything to do with this. Her story was that she arranged to meet with Savannah and she taught her how to self-induce birth by breaking her own water, after which Savannah left, returning two days later to give her the daughter she had. William did not corroborate the story. In fact, he said what really happened. He came home on August 19th and he found Broke cleaning up blood in the bathroom. He helped her clean up and loaded garbage bags full of towels in his truck to get rid of them. He also disposed of shoes that had blood on them. Broke then showed him the baby and said the infant was now theirs and they were a family. The court decided to set a bail for $2 million because they were a flight risk. During the investigation, the police found out that they were looking for travel deals and tickets. The funeral was held on September 7th and it included tributes from the Spirit Lake tribe and it is said that over 1,000 people were present at the services. Many of those attending wore red shirts to honor Savannah and other indigenous women that were missing or had been killed. Ashton was granted full custody of the little baby girl, but she is raised by the entire family. They all participate in her upbringing. On December 11, 2017, Broke finally pled guilty for conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping, and for providing false information to the police. For this, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole on February 2, 2018. She admitted to have lured Savannah in her apartment and then performed a C-section on her while she was still alive. On September 4, 2017, William pled guilty to kidnapping and providing false information to the police. He still had to stand trial for the charge of conspiracy to murder, but the jury found him not guilty of Savannah's death. The judge sentenced him to life in prison, but with the possibility of parole, on October 29, 2018. At the end of 2018, a new bill was proposed to improve resources and capacity to put in the work for finding missing indigenous women and children, but it was stalled, so a new one was proposed in 2019. This bill was passed and signed into law as Savannah's Act by President Trump in 2020.
please hit that subscribe button if you like my channel. See you next time. Bye-bye.